Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Laffron. I'm the assistant city manager and I serve for the city of Greenville. And we have members of our planning staff um, here this afternoon for our sixth code connection session. This is number six in our series. Um, and we meet every month on the second Wednesday. Um, we also have members of our CZB team here this afternoon, and they will be leading today's code connection session. Um, we have Thomas Eddington and Larry Weston that will be leading our session this afternoon. I recognize many of you on our code connection session, and I think most of you probably know Larry and Thomas at this point of the process. Um, our next code connection session, just to mark it down on your calendar so you don't forget, will be Wednesday, July the 13th at 5 p.m. So we hope to see you all back there. And we had such a great response to the code connection session that we did in April, where we had um, the interactive <coughs> session and everyone did a lot of their visual preferences that we are trying to do another more interactive session this afternoon. Um, and so we'll be alternating those um, throughout the months um, as we go forward, but we are going to have a little more interactive of a session today. Um, I will be monitoring along with members of the planning staff, the um, chat room, and we will try to just answer questions at the end as time will permit. So having said that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Thomas to get us started. Great, thanks, Shannon. It's good to see uh, many familiar faces and some new faces. So thanks again for joining us. As Shannon said, tonight we are going to try to keep this a little bit more interactive. So just uh, by way of how about uh, forewarning, I'm using different cameras, monitors, multiple screens. Normally I don't do that. I'm giving this a try tonight. So hopefully this works because we have some kind of fun and kind of interactive polling questions that are um, that are related to the work that we're doing with regard to planning and zoning and also kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what kind of we think in the back of our minds as you know we write new plan and new code. So tonight what we thought we would do is um, walk through the components of the code that really show how this new code will move from a suburban to an urban framework for the new development code. And so uh, tonight you'll kind of get that flavor of where we discuss densities, nodal development, et cetera, which you're all familiar with by now, but we just wanna walk you through a little bit more detail. And um, again, we'll have some polling questions along the way. So um, let's see here. Uh, you know all you uh, you know most of our team already. We've introduced you all to ourselves before. So again, this is where we are. We're about halfway, not quite halfway through this project. And what our uh, intention is, is to, again, try to get this development code in the hands of the planning commission and the uh, council by the end of the year for vote early next. So we've outlined the importance of the goals of GVL 2040. And so as we've continued to delve a little bit deeper into the code work and some of the plans that are actually going to help frame the new development code, what we're really starting to get is a little bit of a, a more detailed framework. And again, this is an urban framework for the new code. Um, it really deals with growth and the uh, anticipated growth and economic development that the community has um, envisioned as part of GVL 2040. But also it's got the component of preserving existing neighborhoods and a goal to preserve open space. That's equally as important as the growth that we intend to accommodate within the nodes. Um, you'll also see the uh, concept of inclusion, the affordable housing, and the improvement for uh, mobility and transit options. All of that needs to take place simultaneously to the growth. If we were to look back at the past 20 years, much of the growth that has occurred um, in Greenville outside of the downtown has been rel relatively suburban in nature and um, has not given as much attention or equal attention to preservation, inclusion, and um, improvements for transit mobility. So the new code will address those issues. Larry, did you want to speak to any of this? I know that you, you, you've kind of been involved um, kind of in this framework creation. Are you good? 
Second. I'm supposed there to wait go. on Larry to. There we go. If there we could go. just ask everyone to mute your your um, speakers or your your microphones, please, during the presentation, because we're picking up some background noise. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Uh, well, I really just wanted to add. I think Thomas made uh, some very good points just now when he was he was drawing a contrast to what's happened in the past. I think it is important for folks to realize uh, and and many of you who are part of this conversation and who've been a part of the process up until now have heard this before, but it really is what we're talking about here really is a new way. It's not just a new code, it's a new way. It's a new way of looking at and planning for development. Um, we're looking to have a, a more simplified process with more predictability that has um, have greater protections built in and that allows for more tools to do the things that we want to do. So uh, yes, and, and when we say it's moving from a, a suburban um, uh, approach to development to a more urban approach to development, what we're saying is that we're looking to make sure that where there is growth and we do expect growth and want growth, that that growth happens in a more predictable and and in a more rational way, and that we give equal attention to the other goals that we have and that have been stated in the uh, Greenville 20, uh, 2040 plan to preserve, to include, and to improve uh, on, our, on our transportation act, access and our transportation links. That would be what I would, I would try and remind our participants about and to make sure that you keep that in mind as we go forward. We've seen some very uh, uh, interesting developments up until now. Things have come together in a way that we couldn't be more pleased with. And we're glad to have, uh, have gotten all of the input from the, uh, uh, from the different interest groups and the different folks that have been involved today. We really do appreciate that. Okay, Thomas, that was no. all I want to emphasize. No, thanks, Larry. That's helpful. So again, keep in mind, as we write a code, a code is written in terms of preparing a tool that developers apply for development applications. It, it can't and doesn't do it all. Additional work with regard to open space and affordable housing will be proactive measures taken by the city, public-private partnerships, nonprofits, et cetera. Do keep that in mind. A code can't do it all, but we can put in as many tools as possible. Um, so we've, um, again, discussed in detail the node and the corridor framework. Um, as, we've, as, as we've continued to uh, scour the existing land management ordinance, you know, we can you know, we're really getting an understanding of the, the, the makeup of the community, not just from a land use perspective, but really from um, kind of a strict zoning and parcel perspective. You know, majority of the community is zoned R6, residential six, six dwelling units per acre. That is the majority uh, zoning land designation within the community now. Much of that is Again, neighborhood and going to be preserved. No, 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 no significant changes in that area. But for the growth, to accommodate the anticipated um, desire for economic development, jobs, et cetera, that gets directed toward the uh, the nodes and the corridors. Much more of a, um, a of an urban framework. Things that you're probably starting to see as you look at some of the for day planning, as you look at some of the, the down, certainly what's happened in downtown and some of the, the fringe areas of the downtown. It's got a more urban component to it. Um, this is um, a slide that you have all seen. We, we want to keep directing you all back to this. The image on the right is um, the image from the GVL 2040 uh, comprehensive plan that notes potential nodes kind of corridor that framework, right? Started to set it up. What you see on the left is again, um, five specific areas that aren't, they're not buzzy anymore. They're defined by parcel lines, et cetera. And those are the district area plans. And as we dig into those, um, we'll start to define what that more urban, what that more um, mixed use uh, zoning framework is for those areas. That will have applicability in some of the other areas. Maybe it's, you know, McAllister relates to Haywood Mall. Maybe certainly neighborhood planning in Greater Sullivan can relate to um, any of the neighborhoods up north in, um, uh, in near Timmins Park, et cetera. So that opportunity 
for us to engage the neighborhoods and the community at large in those specific planning areas. The five noted on the left map um, gives us gives you all an opportunity to really plan for what goes in the zoning code. So that's been a significant opportunity for us over the past couple of months. We've appreciated the input, the attendance at the open houses, and our hope would be to get those plans completed by the middle of summer, late July, right in that time period. So those plans will influence the development code. Um, you know, as we think about um, the code and we think about land use, we're going to ask you all uh, a few questions along the way. And I'm gonna start with the, uh, the first one. And that is, uh, dealing with land use and scale. Can you guys see that question? Yes, there, just came up. Okay. Yes, it just came up. If you guys could kind of read that question and give us your input. You know, as we look at code and planning, um, you know, our preliminary estimates, um, we have a pretty good understanding of what the, the, the land uh, uses are. If you could give us what you think the area of the nodes identified on that right map, what do you think the area would be that we're looking to define as nodes? Maybe it's 10 nodes, maybe it's 12 nodes. As you look at that, what, what, what might that area be as a percent of the uh, total land area within the city? You can, you can uh, click on your answers and I will launch your results in just a second. Looks like 11 of 27 of you have taken it. If you have any questions, certainly unmute yourself and ask as you uh, respond to the questions. We just wanna make sure that you all understand some of the numbers, the acres, the percents that we're dealing with as we look at the code. Okay, I'll give you guys about another 30 seconds. 20 of 30 of you have answered, okay. Thomas, some of our staff may not answer. That's us. fine. So okay. that may be some of the numbers of description. Okay, I'll give you guys another 10 or so seconds. You good? So you guys noted that uh, most of you thought it was somewhere between 10 and 15%. So that's pretty good. It's going to, you know, you know, based on our preliminary numbers, and keep in mind this may change a little, it's right at about 9%, give or take. So really what that means is we're looking at 9% of Greenville's land area as really being the centers, the land to accommodate the future growth. And keep in mind, based on um, recent trajectories, your, uh, your historic trajectories in terms of population and employment growth, you know, that could be about 20,000 uh, uh, households over the next 20 years. So it's significant, but it'll be confined to a relatively small, more urban kind of area. So good job on that, because it looks like 45% of you guessed about 10%. That's good. Okay. So as we look to the new code, it will be moving from this kind of suburban characteristic. Keep in mind that suburban characteristic is pretty typical of what we've seen throughout America. Most of our codes were written in the 60s and 70s. And so by definition, they lend themselves to suburban development. But you'll start to see um, design, characteristics, design component, design thinking that you see in and around the downtown area convey itself to the nodes. And so you'll see that more tight, compact development in the node. So you'll see a little bit more of what is indicated in the image on the right, a physical and a uh, mixed, a physical characteristic and a mixed use component that is a little bit more urban. Um, along the line, let's see. Here is a second question for you. As you think about us writing a code, keeping in mind that your code was written in the late 60s initially, very suburban in nature, um, 
where do you think, what year do you think we were first allowed to start doing zoning? What was the landmark Supreme Court case? You don't have to name the, well, the cases listed village versus versus uh, Ambler Real, uh, Village of Euclid versus Ambler Realty. But what year do you think that we were given the, uh, the authority to zone? The cities were given the authority to zone. I'll give you guys about a 40, maybe 30, 40 seconds. Half of you have answered. Okay, 10 seconds. All right, I am ending and sharing. So it looks like 45% of you answered 1926. So you guys are pretty good on your land use law. That's right, it was in 1926. It was a, a real estate developer uh, fighting with the village of Euclid, which is a small community right outside of Cleveland. And it went to the Supreme Court and it was the decision that gave cities home rule authority to uh, zone their communities, primarily based on the 10th amendment to the constitution, health, safety, and welfare. So good for you guys. Okay. Um, so as we, as we look at it specifically, we, delve down into open space. As the community grows, land will of course become more, uh, it becomes let, uh, uh, let, uh, the supply is reduced, it becomes uh, more costly. And so actually it begins to challenge our ability to preserve some of the uh, vacant land that is in the community. So um, by allowing additional development in the nodes, we can, encourage development to go there rather than sprawl into some of that open space. But more importantly, we can start to um, offer incentives and opportunities for that development. There's additional opportunities to consider potential impact fees for an additional story, maybe some additional density, impact fees that could go into a fund that buys down and preserves forever some of that vacant, undisturbed, undeveloped land that is in the community that people so desperately want to preserve. Again, noting that in GVL 2040, bottom line was we'd like to preserve the 35% of the remaining vacant land. So my question for you is, how many acres are currently vacant or undeveloped in Greenville right now? So our goal is 35% of those that are vacant and or undeveloped. What do you think's available? About halfway through answering, another 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. We're going once, twice. Okay, a couple late comers. Okay, you guys good? I'll close it and I will share it. So. You, know, you guys all kind of hovered in the middle there between 14 and 2,700 acres. Um, the answer is about 2,700 acres that are, that are undeveloped or um, undisturbed. Some of that is, uh, includes some green, uh, green space, green uh, wetlands, I should say, sorry, environmental uh, space that can't be developed. But um, a majority of it is on, the, uh, is on the table for future development. So 2,700 acres, we'd like to preserve about 35% of that. So about a third of it, you know, you're almost looking at um, about a thousand acres is the goal to preserve. That's, uh, that's an admirable goal. And it is one that we will want to, as a community start to tackle early because land will only become more expensive. So nice job on that. Um, 
how does this relate to the affordable housing? Um, you know, as we look at opportunities for additional development, uh, densities, heights in the nodes, we've gone through this um, a few times with you all before, but ultimately what that does is it, is, is it allows for economies of scale. It allows for developers to start to include different housing types, um, so maybe some smaller units, some larger units, kind of a range of housing typologies. We said kind of uh, a bit of a housing ladder um, in a mixed use development, that's not uncommon. In a neighborhood, a suburban development, that gets very, very challenging. So by definition, economies of scale will help us get to a more inclusive community, but it won't do it alone. And with South Carolina not allowing inclusionary zoning, i.e. Uh, a requirement that say maybe five or 10 or 20% of new developments include uh, deed restricted affordable housing, without having that opportunity that other states have, we'll have to also incentivize. So in the nodes, um, we'll have to look at opportunities for an additional story, an additional two stories, additional density to developers to incentivize that portion of the development, um, a portion of that, uh, of those two stories, for example, for affordable housing. Only with an incentive can you actually, or a density bonus, can you require the uh, affordable housing component. So again, this will be um, an economy of scale approach to try to get different kinds of units, as well as potential bonuses that with those bonuses come a requirement for affordable housing. So um, it's a bit of a mixed approach. Uh, let's see. When we- I would just, I would just add too, Thomas, Thomas, one sure. second. I would just add too that while the goal is to make at least 10% of of all new housing units affordable. This is only one of the tools that we can use to get to that goal. I mean, there, the goal could be higher than that using using uh, nonprofit developers, using uh, using other public subsidies and other kinds of activities. So let's keep in mind, this is one tool to add to the tool box to get to the overall goal of, uh, of achieving the level of affordable housing that we all want as a long as a longtime uh, affordable housing advocate, I'm glad to see that we've got a new tool, at least here, to add to our, uh, our existing toolbox so that we can get to the goals that we'd like to all get to. That's right. You certainly have the, the housing trust, you have nonprofits, you have others. It is that multi-pronged approach that will matter. So along that line, do you see the poll up? Um, what is um, affordable housing. Uh, so for a median income household in Greenville, about $60,000 a year, that's about $5,000 a month. What amount do you think uh, that household can spend up to before they're defined as cost burden by the state and or federal government? So it's really what can they spend on rent uh, and utilities, it's housing costs, before we would consider them moderately cost burden. Maybe 10 more seconds. Okay. Good job, $1,500 a month, 30% of your income, 30% of your month, 30% of your gross monthly income uh, is uh, what the government has defined as uh, allowable for, or as a as standard for, uh, for a typical household. Anything beyond that, you would be cost burdened. So $1,500 a month for, uh, rent and utilities in this case. So good job, a majority of you nailed that, that one. Okay. Okay, and I think this is the third component of the uh, uh, three priorities for the GVL 2040, and that is a well-integrated system of nodes and corridors throughout the community. And so with mixed use,
development comes an opportunity for uh, higher residential densities within the node. We would anticipate approximately 30 units per acre, again, urban living in the nodes. And with that mixed use, with that opportunity for residential, commercial, office, retail in the same place, more often than not, people will be able to potentially walk or bike from one use to another without having to make an additional vehicle trip throughout the community. So uh, it's an indirect way of taking cars off the road and uh, giving them additional freedoms and transit opportunities beyond just the car. But if you think about transit between the nodes or from a node to the downtown, um, a node also creates a much larger user group for whether that's a, a bus or a transit station or a stop, creates a much more, uh, uh, a much more likelihood that somebody, a group of people would potentially go from one node to another or one node to the downtown uh, in a much uh, more expedited fashion. And so it offers a, a significant opportunity for existing transit uh, options in the community. You still depend on the car primarily in the city of Greenville. And so we have a question for you regarding transit, your, your current transit patterns. If you could take a look at those three roads, it's North Pleasantburg up near Bob Jones University, Lawrence Road near Verday, and North Church Street down near County Square. What do you think, which of those do you think um, has the highest uh, average annual daily traffic count? I don't think this question allows you to rank, sorry about that, but which do you think has the highest traffic in an average day? And by you all answering this question, you're starting to help to help us define where issues might be, right? Issues that may offer opportunities for new transit connections, et cetera. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Hmm. Okay, so you all felt that North Pleasantburg Drive was the busiest road on average. And you are right. On average, it's about 39,700 cars per day up on North Pleasantburg. And number two is Lawrence Road at about 33,500 down near Verde. And then in third place is North Church Street with about 30,000 cars per day on average. So yeah, good job on that. I would have thought most would have maybe said Lawrence down near Verde. So I thought that was somewhat of a trick question, but you guys aced it, so good job. Um, I think we have about five more slides that kind of outline some of the characteristics of an urban code. Um, and so uh, it's really about a prioritization that uh, focuses on the pedestrian rather than the car. Again, 60s and 70s codes primarily focused on the car, transportation, mm -hmm. uh, the interstate system came into well, effect in the, 50, in the 50s, et cetera. And, off that pad. I think somebody may be off mute. If you have a question, certainly jump in. Um, but this one will focus on the pedestrian. So as we move forward, you'll start to th see things more in line with um, where a typical code would um, you know, note the number of parking spaces per square feet for a retail uh, establishment. Certainly the new code will address that as well, but it'll also include uh, requirements and incentives for bikeways and uh, pathways and trails and connections and different uh, amenities, different pedestrian infrastructure that uh, benefits those of us who are trying to get out of our cars. And so you will see that uh, incorporated into the new code. Along that line, we're wondering if you guys could provide us your thoughts on what the alternative modes of transit most used now are. 
keep in mind, based on the most recent census information, about 88% of the workers age 16 plus either drive or, car or, or carpool. I think it's about 80% drive and about 8% carpool. Um, so what's the, what's the second most popular method of getting around, getting to work, I should say, commuting to work? So we're looking at what are the other 12%? How do they get to work? Hmm. Maybe another 10 seconds. Okay. So the majority of you said public transit. So, hey, this is the first question where I think I may have stumped you all. Um, no, the, the outside of driving alone or carpooling, the most frequented uh, option for commuting to work is walking at 4%. Um, and then the public transit is at about 1.2%, and biking is only at about 0.0 about 0.5 of 1%. There's some other, there, there's some other uh, outlying options. Some people work from home. So that, that includes uh, uh, a significant percent of those not commuting, but um, it's primarily uh, walk and then public transit and then bike. So it's probably um, indicative of those who might live in and or around downtown, uh, their ability to walk to work is probably why that one's a little bit higher. Okay. So the second characteristic of an, uh, of an urban code is allowed uses. Uh, we've discussed this with you all before, um, the idea of integrating uses, mixed uses, rather than separated zoning districts. Typically, hard lines are drawn on the ground and single uses are allowed within those districts in the new code you'll see a lot more mixed use districts, specifically in the nodes around the downtown area. Um, keep in mind that mixed use can be both vertical. It might be uh, retail on the bottom, office, office on the first floor, residential on the upper floors, but it could be you know, single lot development that has maybe an apartment building next to a row of um, restaurants or something. So that integration will be, uh, detailed in the new development code. Um, it will also um, be uh, recommended for some of the areas along the corridors. Some of the corridors right now are only, uh, they only allow for commercial development, but there are some areas where integration of some uh, residential units would provide some uh, additional um, uh, additional uh, opportunities for uh, improvement in terms of economic performance as well in some of those areas that are commercial and uh, becoming a bit dated. As we think about zoning codes and we think about zoning districts, um, you know, we do look at existing land use patterns, of course. So based on standard land development categorization, what percent of Greenville's land do you think is currently defined as compact or urban? The alternative to that is standard. Those are the three classifications. So what percent is compact urban right now? Thomas, can I ask a question? Sure. This is Shannon. I'm going to ask a clarification question to, for our audience. Um, are you asking about the zoning? Nope, this won't be based on zoning. This will be land use categorization. Land use so, category. Okay, yep. just want to make sure everybody knows. Yep, yep. So this is how kind of from GIS data, ESRI data, which is um, uh, a geospatial so the actual data. land use, not and the zoning. Use. That's right. This is land use, not zoning. Good, good clarification. Yep. Okay. It looks like you all have answered. 
Okay, so it looks like well, this was pretty well divided out, um, but the answer is less than 1% actually, based on the land use categorization, um, less than 1% is compact or urban. Actually, uh, it comes out to about 135 acres or so that is compact or urban, mostly in and around the downtown area, mm -hmm. of course. And so uh, maybe that comes as no surprise, but part of our goal moving forward will be to create compact and or urban uh, development categorizations in the nodes, of course. So hopefully we'll see that increase to help accommodate the growth and development that is anticipated. Okay, another characteristic of the new code will be public and connected open spaces. There is nothing wrong with the housing on the left, the use of yards, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you don't have any more space for that kind of development. Your boundaries are pretty well defined. You have some limited annexation opportunities, but pretty defined right now. And so that kind of development is land, consum land consumptive and you don't really have much of that opportunity available. If you did, we would still recommend that you consider denser developments in those kinds of residential uh, areas. But most of it, <coughs> excuse me, will move toward the nodes and in that area, you won't see uh, the, the guards that you see on the left, but um, again, a more urban fabric and you'll see public gathering spaces, public parks, things like that, plazas, et cetera, for gathering. As we move forward with the nodes, one of our goals is to, we've noted, preserve some of the open space, the undeveloped vacant land that exists within the community. But we also are looking at metrics to ensure that within the nodes, we do create percentages of open space, public space for the, uh, for the folks to gather in, to play in, et cetera. That will be a part of the code. Looking community-wide, I wondered, how many acres do you currently have in the community that are protected parks, cemeteries, um, golf courses, trails? Um, again, some of those can be private, but I'm thinking green space. That's we're kind of looking at open green space. Um, keep in mind the size of Greenville is about 18,000. The land area of Greenville is about 18,000 acres. Maybe 10 more seconds. Looks like most of you have answered. Going once, twice. Okay, we're done. So it looks like about 30% of you answered about 750 acres. It's actually 1,100 acres um, that you have preserved now. Some of that is private. Some of that is, you know, the Swamp Rabbit Trail, um, the parks, et cetera, along the Reedy. Um, so you have about 1,100 acres. You know, that's, uh, you know, right at around five-ish percent of the land area of the community. So your goal to preserve, protect 35% of the outstanding 2,700 acres is basically adding another thousand or so acres. In effect, you would be doubling your green space within the community, an admirable goal, a goal that we should aim for, um, but it would basically be um, a 200% of what you have now, which is actually quite good. Okay. Okay, I think second to last slide. Um, Another characteristic is this building mass scale height. We've talked about it um, in the nodes. I won't go through it, but keep in mind in a suburban model code, it's hard to get centers. It's, it's hard to get nodes. It's hard to get cluster development. It's hard to get villages, if you will. The zoning really doesn't allow it. So whether it was that historically we didn't, we didn't want those out in the suburban areas, that's part of our historic development pattern. Now that we do, the only way to really accommodate for that is 
unique um, unique uh, methods that kind of skirt around the code. And that is maybe in most communities planned urban developments. Um, they kind of allow for this new and more flexible zoning within a defined area. In Greenville, you have planned developments. In other communities, they have uh, master development agreements, different ways that we try to break up the monotony or that we have historically tried to do that in the suburbs. So the old codes make it a little bit, it is a little bit confusing. It can be time consuming to actually implement um, a plan development, a PUD and MDA, et cetera. The new code in the nodes will allow density and development by right, period. Hmm. Uh, give me two seconds here. Um, so as you think about these areas, we've been consistent that there'll be these you know, smaller urban business commercial neighborhood centers. What would you most want to see in these areas? What would you like to see that's about 15 minutes from your house you could walk to? And I think if you choose other, the way the Zoom question is designed, I don't think you get to write it in, but you could put it in the, the chat box on the right. Another 30 seconds or so. Okay, 10 seconds. So a majority want a grocery store. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, I'm going to guess that it could be a bigger grocery store. It could be a, almost a bodega style grocery store, a small market, um, just probably to get the day-to-day the -day food items. We, we often hear that. In second place was cafe, coffee shop, restaurant, um, places to gather, eat, kind of that third place. And then um, parks, people want some parks closer. Okay, that's helpful. Um, we do hear often that people won't walk to a grocery store, but I think that for day-to-day -day items, people generally would walk to the grocery store and you guys are actually kind of proving that. So thanks. Okay, I think this is the last slide. Um, parking. We noted that the development pattern outside of downtown is primarily um, a suburban pattern, buildings on the back side, parking lots on the front. We can fix that pretty easily with the code requirements for minimum lot uh, front setbacks. And so what you will see again along the corridors um, and in the nodes, you'll see building patterns start to change and move forward. Um, parking will be relegated to the rear, parking garages if possible in the nodes, depending on incentives. Um, that actually make them financially viable, enough ROI, but you will start to see that pattern change in these areas. Um, as you think about parking lots, as you think about big box commercial development that populates some of the larger corridors, whether it's Lawrence or others, how big do you think this isn't asking about the parking lot, but it's how big do you think in square feet the average Walmart is in America? The impact of this is we typically have minimum numbers of parking spaces based on a thousand square foot or five per 1000 square foot or four per 1000 square foot. So the size of these buildings by the code metric necessitates large parking lots, which is why you see the proliferation of so many of them. Maybe 30 seconds. Hmm. Okay, 10. All right, we're closing. So it, 
that was pretty close between the 175 to 200 K and the 125 to 150 K. So pretty close. Um, the answer is the average size Walmart is 178,000 square feet. And so it's on the, uh, on the lower end, the bottom end of this. And so good job there. Um, keep in mind, depending where the Walmart is and when it was built, they range in size from about 69,000 to 250,000 square feet. So they have a significant amount of variation. But because of that size, that is why we see the kinds of parking lots and the urban development uh, fabric that we, that we see right now. I think we made it to the end with a few minutes to go. Thank you, I don't Thomas. Know, Janet, if there are any questions, but go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Larry. And we have just a few minutes left of our allotted time. And there were a couple of questions that came through with the chat. And so I'm going to I'm going to go backwards to forwards on this one because I thought this was an interesting question. Are golf courses considered protected spaces? So when you were asking the question of the protected spaces related to the open space, uh, did it were golf courses part of that calculation? The golf course there, yes, is the answer they were, and you are correct. They're not a guaranteed protected open space. It's not to say if there's a private golf course out there that they couldn't develop it subject to the right zoning. So they are not protected. They're not, they're not deed restricted. They're not typically protected by a conservation easement. So one day the market dependent, they could disappear. You're right. Thank you. And then the next question is one near and dear to my heart concerning parking. Thanks, Michael, um, for giving this question because we've had lots of conversations about parking. And Michael's question was, will the parking requirements change under the new code? The standards are currently very suburban. And I know, Thomas, you and I have had lots of conversations about That's that, but <laughs> I will let you uh, take this one from here. The answer is yes. Resounding yes. You know, typically codes have a, a minimum a minimum number of spaces per se 1,000 square feet, or um, uh, depending on the the type of commercial or office or retail use. Um, smart codes today they do have often a minimum requirement, but they also have more importantly a maximum requirement because often um, retailers will come in, meet the minimum requirement, note they have additional land, and they'll say, oh, for business or Christmas day, perhaps, might as well just pave that section over rather than say landscaping it or using it for better green infrastructure, et cetera. So um, they're, given that, they're given that right under the code because typically they have a minimum, the new code will readdress the parking standards and include parking maximums and locations of parking as well, behind, et cetera, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. And then we had another question from Susan. Um, that came up, I think she was asking this during one of our questions, um, and she wanted to know if you can give the household size and the data source for the median income example that you used for one of our earlier questions. I think that that one was from the census, and it, I think they took it, that was for a household of four, and yeah, household of four, median income, and I think that was 2019 or 2020, the most recent uh, decennial census would be 2020. Thank you, Thomas. And then we have one other question before we end the evening. And another question from Bill, are there any health or air quality concerns associated with moving residential units closer to traffic? You know, there is always going to be additional, um, some additional uh, pollution associated with being in an urban environment as opposed to say a rural environment. But uh, while I don't have the exact date on that, our understanding is that it's relatively insignificant. It's also worth keeping in mind that as we look at the nodes and as we look at the kind of the planning, the uh, site planning for the nodes, the green space will be an important component to that. Not unlike, you know, um, uh, 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 Central Park in New York or a, a major park in the Commons in Boston, et cetera those do kind of become filters for those who live in that community. And so as we do look at the nodes, we are looking at encouraging and uh, requiring actually, I should say, green space within those areas. So uh, they will have opportunities for fresh air, et cetera. So I think they should be good. 
Thank you, Thomas. And then um, Katie asked about our city limits and what is the likelihood of the city annexing land. And Katie, that's a little bit longer of an answer than we have this evening. But if you want, I will, if you'll shoot me in the chat, your email address, I'll email you and call you about that. But the city is, it, it does have a compact city limits and it is difficult under South Carolina law for us to annex. Um, we cannot do any kind of, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can annex and there's different, there's different rules you have to follow. Um, and with special purpose districts, it's not usually, it's not always attractive to annex. Um, however, in the city, um, in a lot of cases, our millage rate is actually lower than our, um, in the city than in some of the special purpose districts but that's a little bit more of a detailed conversation um, than we have time this afternoon but if you'll get with me i'll get you an answer to that and maybe we can also address that thomas in our next code connection session which leads me also to a comment from kate who said that she thinks it would be beneficial for us to hear czb discuss the common mistakes of new development codes and how those mistakes will not be made under the new greenville development code and would you consider doing this to help us better understand the protections we will have? So that's an idea for our, I think our next code connection session mm -hmm. or that's one of our upcoming code connection sessions as we move into the summer. Um, and I think that's all we had from our comments and our questions. We're at 556. We wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening once again for another code connection session. Thank you to Thomas and Larry for putting together our um, presentation tonight. Um, I thought the multiple choice questions were great. I wonder if there's anyone who got 100% on those questions. Um, I <laughs> if you did join us, me, join our firm. <laughs> yes, I had someone send me a note and said uh, maybe they haven't answer, uh, you know, um, answered this many multiple choice questions incorrectly <laughs> since their SAT. <laughs> I thought was really hilarious. So thank you all for having a good time with us. Um, as I often say, and I hope everyone knows, zoning can be fun. And I think that we try to find ways to make zoning fun here at the city of Greenville. And we hope that everybody's enjoying this process. Please spread the word on our process. We want as many people to be a part of this process as possible as we continue over the next six to eight months um, through this code connection session. We're only halfway through, so it's not too late to have as many people be a part of this process as possible. And we will continue to encourage that. Again, our next code connection session is scheduled for Wednesday, July 13th at 5 p.m. And with that, we will go ahead and say good night. Thank you to everyone for joining. Um, Larry, Thomas, any parting comments before we go? No, thank you so much for staying involved. Keep staying involved. It's important and reach out to your neighbors, friends, colleagues, et cetera. Zoning is important to everybody. It matters to all of us, whether it's you have office development, commercial development, residential development. So keep Please keep staying involved. Thanks. I just second that. Great. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks all. Um,